Okay, hello and welcome to this talk called Bloodhound from Red to Blue. My name is Mathieu Saunier. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at ScoobyMTL. Uh, just a little bit about me. So I work in InfoSec since 2000. I've been a Blue Team member for the last seven years working in different SOC. Uh, I'm a security architect at Bell Canada, which is one of Canada's biggest ISP and uh, telephone company. Uh, my roles are Adversary Detection Team Lead and Threat Hunting Team Lead. I'm also a DEF CON Blue Team Volunteer Village since its creation last year. <laughs> Uh, at this point of the presentation, you might wonder if I'm mentally challenged or uh, if I just have an accent. According to my doctor, it's because I'm French-Canadian that I speak like this. Um, so French-Canadian or Canadian in general, we're nice people until we start talking about hockey. And if you're not from our team, you better STFU. Uh, little bit of advice as well. Um, I do not pronounce H in front of words and I don't pronounce S's at the end of words. A um, little bit of the agenda here, so we're going to do a quick overview of Bloodhound, some basic usage of Bloodhound. We're going to start customizing our Bloodhound, mainly using a Cypher language. Then we're going to focus on destroying attack paths. And finally, we're going to do some reporting and automation. So in the room here, who has worked with Bloodhound before? Okay, and who has used uh, Cypher before, built their own Cypher query? Okay, perfect. Defender thinks in list, attacker think in graph, as long as this is true, attacker win. Very famous quote that you probably heard before from uh, John Lambert from Microsoft. Um, but what does it actually mean? Or actually, well, Bloodhound is one of those tools that can help you shift that and see uh, your network as a graph. So when we talk about list, what do we mean? Well, we mean these kinds of lists. So the list of asset, a list of server name, a list of group, uh, some serial numbers, all things that are very useful. And then when you go inside this, you have yet more list about install software, uh, open ports maybe, compliancy check, uh, vulnerability list, so on and so forth. When we're talking about a graph, what are we talking about? Well, first of all, graph is not only for security, it's for anything. Um, so well, I'm going to give you an example in the real world. So this is you and Alexis, and you're in a restaurant. Come along, Taylor and Jordan. Now you become infatuated with Jordan. So you want to get, you want to get something. So you're going to leverage different relationship in order to get what you want. So you're going to get your family relationship to Alexis, which is a co-worker of Taylor, which is a friend of Jordan. And with that, you will get Jordan phone's number. And by the icon I choose for phone number, you get an idea of how old I can be. Now, I hope you also like the fact that I'm using gender neutral names and relationship. Make a big effort uh, into this. Now, a graph for an attacker or for a defender as ourselves would look a little bit like this. So you have a user that has a relationship or actually the attacker will land somewhere usually uh, impersonating a user through password spray, phishing or any other means. And then that user will have an admin right, for example, to his own machine. A very bad infosec practice, but it does append more than we want. Then from that machine, he might be able to RDP to a server, such as a terminal server, onto which there will be a lot of user having sessions. Uh, depending on the size of your organization, it can go from uh, hundreds to thousand. And among all of those user, one has a little crown here, so that user has a session. And why does it have a crown? Well, because it is member of a high value group such as domain admin. So this is a little bit what Bloodhound shows you when you use it. So a little bit of overview. So what is Bloodhound? Uh, this is the only slide with so much word, but Bloodhound used graph theory to reveal the hidden and often unintended relationship within Active Directory environment. So both attacker and defenders can use those paths uh, to identify very complex attack paths, and defender can use them to actually eliminate them. 
a little bit about the history of Bloodhound. It was introduced at DEF CON 24 in a talk called Six Degree of Domain Admin. Here's the link if you haven't seen it. And in that talk, you can see Rowan actually unlock his a password manager and make the repo public. It was actually demoed a few days before that at B-Side Las Vegas as well. Uh, I became in touch with uh, Bloodhound at Black Hat 2017 in a talk called The Industrial Revolution of Lateral Movement from Tal Mahar and Tal Barry, where they explain how to automate all of this process of querying and exploiting uh, the path. Very interesting talk. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. Last year at uh, Black Hat 2018 Arsenal, Bloodhound 2.0 was released and Bloodhound is developed by Waldo, Captain Jesus and Armjoy, people I'm very sure you're familiar with. So what does Bloodhound do exactly? Well, it does three little very simple things. First of all, it queries your Active Directory, then it imports the data into a Neo4j backend, and then with the GUI, it shows relationship between the objects. Why should we use Bloodhound? Well, for the red team, you can build attack path offline. That reduce a lot the, lo the noise on the network. For example, when a, an attacker lands, he scans or he queries that uh, active Directory, instead of port scanning all the subnets he has access to and then jumping on a machine, stealing all their credential, jumping on another machine, they then come back, try another machine, steal all the password, uh, all the ashes, so on and so forth. So he can know exactly which machine to target, which account to target, where he's going to go next, and exactly where he's going to land. For Blue Team, we can use the same type of query to find the busiest attack path. So the paths that give are most of our user access to high privilege accounts. And then we can destroy those paths before they are exploited. Or we can actually even monitor them if we are advanced enough. So we have, we have all the chains in JSON, so we can ingest that, and then we can follow the trail. So we can see if a user authenticate, if user X authenticate on machine B, and then steal this credential and go somewhere else, we can follow the trail. But that's a little bit more advanced. Now we're going to talk about the basic or the first steps. First of all, we need ingesters. So there's three main ingesters for Bloodhound. There's SharpBound, which is a C-sharp executable. There's Invoke Bloodhound, which is a Python script that loads reflectively Bloodhound, and then a SharpBound, and then there is the Bloodhound Python that was developed by Dirk Chen from Foxit. Um, so you can leverage this if you land in a Linux box, for example. You can still get all the goodness from Bloodhound. And then on the right side, you see some collection, uh, some switches that you can use. So collection method, or dash C for short, all is usually what we're going to use. And you can add logdown because all does not include logdown because in Windows Server 2016 and Windows 10 10th anniversary, you need to be local admin in order to get that information. Then if you want to be a bit more stealthy, you can use VC only. This is usually not something that we as Defender are really, um, we don't really care about that, but I just put it here. Um, to explain it. Then a very interesting one is max loop time that goes with the collection at uh, the session loop. By default, Bloodhound will try to get sessions for two hours. In our, in our case, or the case of the Defender, usually we will want to extend that time frame. Because as you probably know, there's some admin tasks that are done only at night. But if you run it two hours at night, then you won't get your user data during the day. So it's a good idea to run it to two, uh, 24 hours or more, maybe two days, over the weekend and shift when you collect your data. Then there's a search forest switch that is interesting if you have more than one forest. So it will query all your different forests. For all the other switches and information, you can use sharpound h for help, or you can go directly in the source code. Sometimes there are some options that are not documented in help, or the switch change a little bit, and the help file is not always up to date. Now the GUI. Well, this is a screenshot of the GUI, but there's nothing like a live demo. So let's jump into the real UI. So this is the screen that you get when you launch the tool. Um, so you have domain admin on your right and all the members on the left. Okay. That's great. I'm not seeing my mouse. That's going to be great. You. Hmm. 
Do you feel a bit dumb now? Can I see it here? Okay. If, uh, cool. Okay. So here you see the database information. So you see that we have uh, roughly 5,000 users with uh, roughly 5,000 computers. Uh, here you have NUD info. So when you click on something, you'll get all the properties. And here you have uh, the pre-built query. Most of the time, the query that probably you're all most familiar with is find shortest path to domain admin. So you click here, you select your domain, and off the little dog, dog go. Uh, while those is a nice thing, we're going to look into the just continue our tour. So here you have your custom query. To edit custom queries, you can click on the little pen here. It's going to bring up a text editor, and you can uh, add queries. I'm going to share a link a bit later in the presentation where I give all of my Cypher queries that are in this list. Um, now, if we click on any of the edge, like any user here, as I said, brings up the information about it. What we can do also, we can right click on one and then we can have, um, we can go to edit node. So we're going to see the information if it's on the domain and uh, all the properties of the node. And we can add any property that we want if we need to. Another thing that we can do with the right click is um, mark as owned. So if we know that this credential, uh, this object was owned by an attacker, we can mark it as own, and we can mark it as high value as well. <coughs> Last thing, we can set it as a starting node, and you'll see that it appears here on top, and then we can use a little road here and do exactly like in Google Map and type our destination. In this case, we want to go to domain admins, and it's going to create the path from that user to domain admin. Other um, things that are interesting here is you can right click any edge and get help about what it does. So here, very bad uh, render, but anyway, uh, help on RDP. So you have all the information, how you can abuse some OPSEC con uh, consideration, and then some reference that you can go read further. Um, you can use this, as you saw, it was a bit long to generate the shortest attack path graph. So if you have a more, like a very big database, it's gonna, it can take hours to generate. So you can export the graph either uh, in PNG, so an image, or in JSON file that you can load after using this little button here, and it's going to be way faster to generate your graph. Um, here you can upload data, but you can ju basically just drag and drop in the UI, it works as well. This change layout, and here we have the settings. So in the settings, uh, two things I want to point out. First of all, the query debug mode, which works with the raw query bar down here. So every if this is enabled, every time you click somewhere, it's going to update the query at the bottom. And this is very helpful when you want to learn Cypher and you want to modify your own query. You start with that, and then you modify as you want. And then the most important feature, I guess, of Bloodhound is the dark mode. Uh, that was introduced in Bloodhound 2. Every time I say dark mode in this presentation, there's a fairy that is born. <laughs> um, now, a few, oh uh, yeah, one last thing. Here we have some filters. So if we're not interested in all of the uh, links or edges, we can remove one, uh, the ones we don't need, and then we can rerun the query. And then there's a few shortcuts key that are not documented that I want to share with you. Uh, so for example, we can click on control. We can click on control and it's going to toggle on and off the labels on our graph. So it might be useful to show or not show depending on who you're sharing your data with. Um, then you can use uh, shift, control, and I to bring a console here where you can see errors if there's any and some useful information. No. Cool. Okay. Um, there's a space bar also that brings spotlight, and you can see any object in your graph, and then you can click on it. Um, you can use here in the search bar, as you see, you can see you can search for user, but something that a bit less known, you can search for GPO like this, so you see all the GPO that the tool gathered, and 
you can use OU like this, and it's going to show you all the OU that it gathered. Last key that I want to share is a common R that's going to just reload and refresh the whole thing and bring you back to where you started. Back to the presentation. So this is just a quick uh, reminder of all the comments. I said they were undocumented, so I documented them. So now they are documented at least somewhere. Now we're going to talk about the graph database that is behind um, this, so the backend, Neo4j, another freeware, so you can download it there. And you start it like you would start any other services by uh, invoking it with start. You can stop or restart. And then you can access the control on uh, local host port 7474. You might wonder why use the web console instead of the, U the GUI to build your query. Well, there's two good reasons. One, it has a dark team, fairy. And uh, it points you the error if you make any uh, typos or error in your um, Cypher query. So here, it gently points me that the equal sign here is not good. So when I change my equal for the semicolon, it actually will return me um, the information that I ask. And here, I just ask. I want the group that have the property high value set to true and then return me all the names. So those are the four groups that are uh, high value by default when you launch Bloodhound. Now we're going to do some customization or learning to run. So some basic cipher. All cipher uh, query starts with a match and then you need to specify some objects. So in Bloodhound, we have uh, user, computers, groups, and uh, GPO and OU, I think. Uh, and then you, have, you can use a dot to access their properties, in this case, uh, username. Then you have relationship, which is a bracket with a little arrow pointing in a direction and the relation type inside. Then you have the path finding, which is shortest path from one variable towards another one, and in this case, we want all the path with all the level. That's why we start with one, one up, until unlimited up. Then you have where, where you can do some filtering, and then you return the value that you want to your console. There's two ways of filtering. There's the explicit way, and there's the um, using the where clause. So this is um, explicit, so you say, I want a group where the name is domain user at testlab.local. I want another group where the name is domain admin at testlab.local. And then I want to have the shortest path between my object one and my, well, object n and object m, and then return the path. When we do it with a where, it looks a little bit like this. So we declare our variable n group m group again, and then our shortest path from n to m. And then we will say where name, n name starts with domain user, and n name contains domain ADM. It could be starts with, ends with, just to show you that uh, some virtuous versatility. And then again, you return the path. So here are the query side by side. When you run them, you get the exact same result. So why should you use one versus the other? Reason number one is the time it takes to gather. So it's way faster to use explicit than it is to use uh, where. On the other end, if you're a consultant or if you have multiple domain, where is a bit more useful because you don't need to recreate your query for every customer or for every domain that you have. Using the console, we can also improve our query. So when we do not optimal query, it's going to show like this with an exclamation mark. When you click on the exclamation mark, it's going to tell you how you can improve your query, and then you can change it. So here, basically, what we're doing, we're looking for a user with a, path, a shortest path from the user to high value group, and we want to return the number of users that have a path. So the two. So you see that the exclamation marks are deleted, and this is the new query where you actually define your variable right inside of your shortest path function. So this is the proper way of doing it. Um, so yeah. 
Pro tip number one, explain and profile. So to get, to help you um, improve your query, you can use explain. You can append explain, explain, explain or profile in front of your match query. If you run explain, it's gonna execute plan, but not run the statement, whereas profile with that, <clears throat> will actually run the statement and you'll see exactly which operator is doing most of the work. So here's a query that show you again uh, any object towards any object with high value. Because we're not specifying the type, we need to say that n, the starting node and the end node must not be the same. And then we return a name and the label and we count them. When we run explain, it's going to give us this when we run profile is going to give us this. So it's pretty much the same thing, but the numbers are not exactly the same, and this will also give you the time. Here's a quick slide to show you how complex a uh, cipher query can become. So here you have some optional match, some collect, uh, you count things, you extract, you filter, you unwind. So lots of uh, more advanced features. Those are queries that were shared in the Bloodhound Slack. Uh, and I believe they were both created by Waldo originally. Here are some useful query that you can run. So first of all, uh, about domain user. So this is usually one of the things that I like to start with, is to find every right that domain user have on, on the network. So we're gonna start with where domain user or local admin or where domain user uh, the shortest path from domain user to high value targets. Where does the domain user can RDP to? And we're going to remove those links, this low hanging fruit. Then we can look at all the other bad rights that they have. So all of those queries are in the, my GitHub page that I'm going to share. Then you can look for Kerberos thing or Kerberos table account. If you don't know what Kerberos thing is, it is a technique where as you request a weak cipher in RC4 of a password and you crack it offline uh, for a service principal name. So for uh, functional IDs basically. If you want more information about Kerberos thing, I suggest you go see the excellent website adsecurity.org by Sean McAuliffe. And then I also bring back the top 10x that used to be in version one, but they're removed in version uh, two, because I think it's a good way to start hunting in your database and give you some uh, nice information about where to start. Here's the link to the repo, and at the end, I'll have the last slide. We'll have a link to the whole presentation, so you don't need to take pictures of everything. It's all going to be there. Um, if you want to know more about uh, Cipher, here's a cheat sheet made by Neo4j where you see the main keywords, what they do, and there's lots of documentation online. Now that we know how to build Cipher queries, we're going to start destroying paths. So we're going to start in a control environment and we're going to start by creating a problem ourselves. So we're going to use the merge command to create a link between domain user and a computer 673 and we're going to give and we're going to create an admin link an admin admin to edge from the two. So we're going to merge all that. When we run this, we get one relationship was created. Now we're going to test that the new relation was actually created and so we're going to do uh, a path where groups uh, domain user is admin to computer 673 and we're going to return the path. Not surprisingly, here is our relation. Now I'm going to show you two ways to actually uh, test your, remedi your remediation. First of all, we're going to filter out relation. So here we have a match on our domain user uh, group towards uh, our admin link towards our computer 673, and we're going to remove all relationships where the type of the relationship is admin2, and then we're going to return the path. This is method number one, filtering out. Second method is deleting the relationship. So same beginning, we have our domain user, admin2, computer673, and we're going to delete the relation. We need an extra command to actually print. So exact same beginning, but instead of delete R, we're going to print. And not surprisingly, when you run those commands, you get no data. Now that we have something that works, we're going to test it against live data. 
So here's again our uh, basic query about finding all the domain user path to domain admin, uh, the shortest path. So when we run this, we get this um, the, the, this path, sorry. So now you might wonder when you should use filter out versus deleting. If you have only one edge of a type, it's, it's, it's a good place to use filter out. If you have multiple, you're better to delete it. So here in this example, we're going to tackle execute decom on the top here. And as you can see in the path, there is no other execute decom. So it's a prime target for filtering out. So here's how, how it looks. So we are same, the, the beginning is the same. And then we're going to uh, filter out the relationship, execute decom, and we're going to return the path. If our mitigation was right, we should not have any path to domain admin anymore. Houston, we have a problem. There's still a path, but now instead of six ops, it's nine op away. So the mitigation that we want to apply or that we want to push to our sysadmin is not effective. It's not going to fix our problem. So this is one of the reasons why you want to test before you ask people to do something. If you ask them to do things and in the end you have the same number of vulnerable or the same number of path, uh, they're going to lose faith in the product, they're going to lose faith in the process, and most importantly, they will lose faith in you and your process and your team maybe. Pro tip number two, um, now we have five groups that are high value by default. In your organization, you must probably have more than that. So here's a query to find groups that have a name that contain admin and that don't have the I value property set. And then you're going to return those names. So here, for example, we have Asia admins, Europe admins, and North America admins. So three more groups that, are, that the user are admin. So what we're going to do is going to use the same beginning, but instead of returning the value, we're going to set the value, the attributes, to true. So this will change our five group from the beginning, when we run the high value groups, to eight groups. Now pro tip number three, it's, it's nice to have the group that are high value, but what about the member inside of those groups? Those are also high value targets. So here is a query that will actually set all of the user inside the, those groups to true. For those who have a good eye, you might have noticed a little something different about this query. The relationship is reverse, so it goes from right to left. This is just to show you how flexible the query, the cipher language is. So what it looks like, it looks like this. So by default, this is domain admin and the user, so you see that there's no diamond uh, for the user, so that means that they are not high value. When you run that query, it's going to change to this. So all the user inside of all of the groups that you have tagged as high value will become high value target. When we do the shortest path, it's going to start from looking like this, from domain user to dom uh, high value groups, to this. So you see that you have a lot more paths that you need to take care of if you really want to remove problems from a domain user. Pro tip number four, I know, I know, it's not Christmas and I keep on giving. <laughs> so here is the, the shell version of it and I'm going to talk about it a bit more later, but here uh, I use it just to show you um, the time. Uh, so, yeah. so here yeah, there's a small difference between the two, and uh, if you can spot it, it's right here. So in the first one we return a path, and in the second one we return an attribute. It's much faster to return an attribute than the whole path. So if you don't need the actual path and you just need some attributes, use that instead. It's gonna, you're going to save lots of time. Again, another tip to, f to make your query more performant. There's a small difference between those two queries, and it's right here. So if you don't need to do anything with the relationship, you do not need to assign a variable to it. It's going to save some time. So here the query, basically, maybe I should just explain. Uh, you're looking for um, domain admins, shortest path to anything, basically. If you want to learn more about Cypher and how to use Bloodhound defensively, there's a good webinar from SpectreOps called Operationalizing Bloodhound Attack Graph for Defense. Here's the link. 
Uh, you can also read Sad Processor Year of the Blue Dog Post or his excellent Whisperer and Book. Then, of course, there's the Bloodhound Slack. Here's the link if you want to join, especially the Cypher queries. There's lots of people there, including myself, that can help you uh, with your queries. Now we're going to talk about reporting. Attacker thinks in graph, management needs metrics. So I want to thank Sad Processor for that one. First query we're going to run is the percentage of user with a path to domain admin. So we're going to start with our query where we're going to look at the user, uh, any user that has a path to a group called domain admin, and we're going to count also, we're going to do a second match where we're going to count all the user that we have in our database. So distinct user as user total. And then we can account the user that has a path, and we're going to assign that to a variable that you as a path, so user as a path. And then we're going to do some math directly in the return function, where we're going to say user that has a path divided by the total of user, multiply by 100, give us the percentage. So right now, in our database, we have 100% of user that have a path to DA. Normal, we created links earlier in order to do that. Now you can show in, in table like this, month over month, your progression. So percentage of user with DA can go from 157, 12, and all your other queries, all your other metrics can be there. If this is not visual enough for your management, you can use gauges. <laughs> and honestly, if they don't understand these ones, I cannot help you anymore. Uh, those ones were built uh, very easily with uh, Google Docs, for example. Now this is a query that I'm extremely proud of. I worked very, very hard and I actually found, I made it work just last week. So uh, I just put it in. Uh, what it does actually is give, it gives you domain admins with session on non-DC machines. So your domain admins should only l log in into domain admins and not on any other computers. Otherwise they leave their ashes there and they can be stolen. So the query is here uh, says that you want a computer that is member of a group where the group is not domain controller and you're going to assign that to a variable called non-DC. Then you're going to use your non-DC machines and you're going to get all the sessions on that machine, so all the users that have a session on that machine and all the, all the of those users, all the users that are in the group domain admin. And then you can account, uh, you're going to print the username, the, all the distinct username, and you're going to count their connection. Just want to highlight here that, again, Cypher, pretty powerful language. You can nest as many relationships as you want in your path. When you run that query, you're going to get something like this, where you get the name of all of the uh, the, the name of all of the admins or the domain admin accounts, sorry, that you have, and the number of computer they are connected to that are not in domain controller. If this information is not enough, maybe you have some username that are hard to identify or to match with user, you can use, you can display more attributes than only one. So here you can see that using brackets, you can use, uh, you can refer to multiple um, properties of the object. Now here's a, here's a little uh, log graph of all the other queries. Um, this is not probably the best way to display it. Uh, you're bright people. I'm sure you can come up with better ways of um, showing this data. Uh, but at least I get some points, I guess, for the Dart team. Now we're going to talk about some automation. <laughs> so we're back in the shell, uh, and Neo4j ship with um, a command that actually uh, lets you talk directly to the database. So what we're going to do, we, we go to the bin directory, we export our username, we export our password, and then we can paste our query, Cypher query, right there with the Cypher shell. Uh, one important note is that um, you need to uh, enclose your query in brackets. So it's a good habit to always use double quotes in your queries 
and then you can use single quote when you're using that. Or the other way around, doesn't matter. You can use single quote when you build your query if you're more used with single quotes, and then use double quotes in the shell. But not, try not to mix and match because you're going to have lots of problem. So here the query, uh, basically we're looking for a Kerberos table account in high value groups. So that's why you have groups high value equal true and the property as SPN equal true. Then we're going to return the name as username and the group name as group, uh, as you can see in the return function here. So in the shell is going to look like this. So it's pretty readable, but it's even more readable if you send that information into a CSV. Now we're going to cap the CSV output and we're going to get something like this. So Q8 is just because the query that I've run is my eighth query in my list. But you can add uh, maybe the month, uh, the date on your query so you can keep track. Now from this output in CSV, if you open in a spreadsheet, it gives you something like this. So that's very easy to share with your management, with your admins, and everybody. I mean, who cannot open a spreadsheet, right? Now, we can also do some alerting. So month over month, we run the same query, or week over week, or whatever uh, the time frame you do. So you run the query, you compare with the last result, and then you alert if the number increase. For example, this month, we have uh, one Kerberosable account in high value group. Next month, we have three. We want to investigate why we have three. We want to maybe create a ticket for that. Maybe it's legit, maybe not, but then we can adjust and we can make sure. It's already time for the conclusion. So I think I went way faster than usual. Um, <laughs> So using a tool like Bloodhound, Defender can think in graph too. Uh, I think I've demonstrated that Cypher is a very flexible language. Um, and uh, it's important, I want to reinforce the, the fact that it's very important to test the real impact of a remediation before you contact your sysadmins um, or your, uh, your administrators. So they, they keep on believing in the process and in the tool and in the mechanics. Also, another little uh, takeaway is that not all query are worth automating with Bloodhound. I'm going to give you an example. It's easy, as you saw, to see all the domain admins from your domain with Bloodhound. But you probably want to, you will run Bloodhound maybe once a quarter, once a month, once a week. But you probably want to be alerted in real time when there's a new domain admin in your group. So you better use Windows Event ID 4728 instead of using Bloodhound for that. Now it's, it's time for the thank you. So I want to thank Beside Charm for giving me my first um, opportunity to talk here in the US. I want to thank uh, Sean McAlf, Tal Berry, and Daniel Bohannon for all the talks that they're doing, the way they're sharing things, the energy they put. They really inspired me to submit a talk here today. And a very special thanks to Waldo and Captain Jesus for being very uh, supportive of the whole community, giving free tools, and uh, just being really nice sports in general. As promised, here are the links uh, for the, all the slides. If you have question, I think we have plenty of time. Any questions? Yes? What's the learning curve on the Cypher query language? Is it something that's easily picked up, or is there online training? OK, so the question was, how, how's the learning curve for Cypher query? Um, Cypher query is a language that is uh, used a lot, so it's easy if you want to do something to Google the function you want, and there's generally a, a st um, open stack discussion or some discussion, some forums that will give you an answer. It won't be related to security, but usually you'll be able to adapt. So if you're if you're familiar with a, uh, database language in general, I think it's uh, similar. I have zero programming experience, like zero, zero, and I could pick it up and start building interesting things with it. Any other questions? Thank you very much for your time.